let's get to Kenya, where we've seen a great deal happen. Obviously, on Friday, Kenya's top court gives democracy a second chance. That's Bloomberg View headline. With its decision to nullify the results of last month's presidential election, Kenya's top court has invalidated the votes of some 15 million citizens. It has also struck a blow for democracy that will reverberate across Africa. Now comes the hard part, holding new elections within 60 days that are untainted by the irregularities, intimidation and violence that have scarred past contests. The court's unprecedented decision, the first time the re-election of an incumbent president has been reversed anywhere on the continent, came in response to challenger Odinga's complaint that President Kenyatta's re-election victory was abetted by vote rigging. The court found irregularities and illegalities in the transmission of results. The court has yet to release its full written judgment. I think they've got to do that with some dispatch now. Yet what matters is the process is working. One candidate filed a complaint, the court issued a decision, and the other candidate agreed to abide by it. The judiciary has affirmed its independence and moved to defend the integrity of Kenya's electoral process, bolstering the confidence of both investors and voters. These developments also mark a deeper entrenchment of democracy in Africa, as demonstrated by the strength of opposition parties in Gambia, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal and South Africa. The danger is that the run-up to new elections in Kenya's highly polarized environment and the inevitable disappointment of the losing side will trigger violence. To give clear guidance to Kenya's electoral commission, the court needs to release its full ruling as soon as possible. A credible election demands a commission that commands greater public confidence a working and secure electronic voting tallying system should not be beyond the reach of a country known for its digital innovations. New election will be closely fought, but the court's intervention should strengthen the public's faith in Kenya's judiciary and, by extension, its political process. That's a victory for all sides. Uh, New York Times, Kenya's giant step for fair elections, the Supreme Court's courageous decision to nullify the re-election of President Kenyatta is a critical first for Kenya and Africa, demonstrating that democratic institutions are capable of acting independently and resolving disputes that in the past have often spilled over into violence. This was interesting. The ruling was also rebuked to international monitors and diplomats, and to this page were too quick to dismiss charges of irregularities, largely out of relief that the August 8th voting had been mainly peaceful in the hope that disappointment with the results would not lead to the sort of violence that erupted after the disputed 2007 election, in which hundreds of people were killed. The court did not implicate President Kenyatta had been declared victor by a comfortable 54% of the vote. Mr Kenyatta, whilst arguing that the judges had acted against the will of the people, declared he would respect the ruling. Um, the Kenyan Supreme Court has done a major service to democracy and the rule of law and has provided a much-needed lesson to international observers. My piece over the weekend is Court Ruling Impacts Economy. Friday was a day of unprecedented and high drama. The Supreme Court of Kenya's 4-2 decision to annul the election was an unprecedented move in Africa and the first time on the continent that a court ruled against the electoral victory of an incumbent. The Chief Justice David Moraga declared Kenyatta's victory invalid, null and void. This is only the fourth occasion worldwide when this has happened. Ukraine, Maldives and uh, Austria refer. The judges ordered a new vote to be held within 60 days. Given the damning nature of the verdict with respect to the IEPC, the court ruled that it had failed, neglected or refused to conduct the presidential election in a manner consistent with the dictates of the Constitution. It's unclear to me how the 60-day deadline is met. I would recommend that we look at the marble solution a la Gambia. The court's decision was unprecedented because in such cases courts have weighed the level of malfeasance and infraction in the balance, and typically where the margin of victory is so wide Courts have taken the view that the level of infraction does not rise to a threshold which would have altered the result. Here, the Supreme Court ruled on a literal and narrow constitutional basis. 
the president's lawyers were outplayed and slow to appreciate the ground had shifted. Interestingly, the immediate media response to the decision spoke of a coming of age of Kenya's institutions and Renaissance Capital's Charlie Robertson tweeted, elections are costly in Kenya and disruptive to the economy, but there are hard to quantify benefits from independent judiciary and rule of law. Markets hate uncertainty is a refrain that reverberates through the markets, and on Friday we saw a big outsized bearish reaction. The stock exchanges and circuit breakers kicked in and the stock exchange was halted for 30 minutes when shares had fallen by 10%. Subsequently, trading resumed in the Nairobi All Share closed minus 3.69%. It's plus 22.18% so far this year. And the NSE 20 closed minus 3.47%. That index is plus 22% a year to date. I am afraid we're going to see further selling pressure this week. The shilling, which was at a four-month high before the ruling closed, minus 0.4%. And our average yield over Treasuries blew out 25 basis points on the EMBI Global Diversified Index to 411 basis points. Kenya's $2 billion sovereign bond, maturing in 2024, fell 1.33 cents, according to trade web data, the lowest since mid-August. The historic Supreme Court ruling pours uncertainty on the Kenyan economy, said Emma Gordon, an analyst at Veris Maple Croft. Investors will be concerned about the financial implications and the high risk of violence, she said. With the possibility of the new election going to a second round and the result being contested again, political uncertainty could easily last the rest of the year. Today we're throwing songs, not stones, said opposition supporters to John Aglinby. We need all to make sure we keep it that way. Quarter one GDP expanded at the slowest pace since 2014. And clearly another 60 days of electioneering is hardly going to be a growth ignition. The two principles need to deconflict their language because otherwise there will be more blood in the water. Clear evidence shows that the commission was taken over by criminals who ran the general elections using the technology system and inserted a computer-generated leadership, said Rilo Dinger. President Kenyatta said, we shall revisit this thing. We clearly have a problem. The COTU uh, uh, Secretary General Francis Atuali asked President Kenyatta to sober up while addressing his supporters. Here, NASA is seen hitting the campaign trail in Nairobi. Um, immediately after that, I think this was on Saturday or Sunday. Here we have a photograph of William Ruto, the crowd in Kiabu County. So just to mention, Kenya is the fourth where we've seen such a decision. Ukraine, Maldives and Austria are the others. The IEBC, according to a report from James Lockwale, was in a day-long crisis meeting following the Supreme Court edict. For the record, the IEBC tweeted, we have not had any scuffles or crisis meetings as reported, all is well, save for the fake news. Put up a photograph of Raila Molo Odinga, um, another uh, 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 chart of the yield on Kenya's $2 billion worth of euro bonds June 2024, which soared 19 basis points, the most since July 6th. I said to John Agnew of the FT, the economy was already on the ropes. This is a punch in the solar plexus. We're going to have another 60 days of God knows what, I said. Kenyan growth jitters rekindled as court orders election rerun. There was a lot of exuberance that the elections were over. A fellow from Genghis Capital inquiries had shot up from private equity firms, from foreign investors who were holding off on investments. A lot of investors will hold off again just to see how this plays out. This writes off the second half as things slow down. Um, prospect of further political upheaval has spooked the financial markets with the yeah, FTSE NSE 25 index slumping 4% on Friday most of the year. Bond yields, as we've already said. Kenya's economy has been one of the continent's star performers, expanding at an average of 5.7% a year since Kenyatta took office in 2013. The growth rate eased to three a low of 44.7% in the first quarter's drought curved agricultural production. 
Last month's vote spawned new challenges as fears of a repetition of ethnic violence have claimed more than 1,100 lives. After a disputed 2007 election curbed consumer and business spending and scared off tourists, shops, restaurants, hotels emptied for about a week around the election and the normally congested streets were mostly empty. While the results announcement did spark protests, violence is mainly confined to opposition strongholds in Nairobi slums in the western city of Kisumu. The opposition said more than 100 people were killed when the Kenya National Commission for Human Rights put the death toll at 24. In the few days before the election, business was very good because customers were stocking up. This is Chandarana. Um, but saying now it's totally slowed down. Right now business is back to normal, but as far as for the coming election, I don't know what is going to happen. We have to get through a difficult period of uncertainty until the second election is concluded. If this process can be completed with contained address in 60 days, then 2018 still looks rosy. I can't see major economic decisions being undertaken and cannot see credit growth picking up. This is John Gumi, chairman of Kenya Pipeline. Other than rain-fed agriculture, in the sectors one should be anxious about are tourism, construction and retail. Banking is another, where reduced economic activity, especially the impact of this on small businesses, is a real worry. Gunmen killed two police officers guarding a church on Kenya's south, south coast on Sunday. That's not a good sign. I interviewed with Alan Kasuja in a van outside the Sarova Stanley early this morning at five to, between five and six. I'll put up a photograph or two. Nairobi all share, even after the fall on Friday, is still up 22.18% year to date. NSC 20. It fell 3.47% on Friday, but that's still up 22% year-to-date. Nairobi Business Ventures reported full-year earnings. Revenue slumped 45%. Um, they reported a loss before tax of 32.84 million versus a profit of 6.3 million last time. They haven't told me what the EPS is. And then interestingly, there's the following comment about whether there are going concerns. In considering the going concern basis used for preparing the financial statements, the directors have considered the financial position and the performance of the company. The latest period presented as well as its prospects for a period of not less than 12 months from the date and issue of the information memorandum. For the year ended to 31st March 2017, the company generated a loss of 32.8 million. Use cash of 26 million in operations and a net current asset position of 68 million. My question is, is it a going concern? That's not clear to me. Once again, thank you for stopping by.